Hey everybody, Smart Silver Stacker here. Hope you're doing well. Today's video is for all of you new gold and silver stackers out there, folks who are looking for just some basic information about how to get started with gold and silver, because I know there's a lot of you out there right now. There is a lot going on in the world at the moment. There is a tremendous geopolitical risk to the dollar status as the world reserve currency. You've got China leading these de-dollarization efforts around the world and the BRICS countries doing the same thing. They're talking about getting a new currency. You know, Saudi Arabia might ditch the petrodollar sometime soon. And also here in the domestic economy, we have persistently high inflation. We've got SVB and Signature Bank. They just collapsed. The second and third largest bank collapses in U.S. history occurring within days of one another. And these events, you know, this ongoing saga that we're watching as the you know economy kind of falls apart before our eyes, it, a lot of people are paying attention to this and they're making the decision to get into some hard assets, some assets that will hedge against inflation, gold and silver, you know, they've been money for thousands of years, so that's not going to change anytime soon. And they can't get uh, bailed in by your bank. They're outside of the financial system. They can't get inflated away. So there's a lot of reasons right now to be getting into gold and silver. And recently, I made a video that was tips for new stackers. And that video was you know, kind of all over the place. Uh, did get a lot of views, got a pretty good reception. That's kind of what's clued me into the fact that there are a lot of new stackers out there is that that video, you know, there's a lot of demand for that information. Uh, but on that video, I had some comments that I had left out some very basic stuff. You know, things like where to buy your bullion, what type of bullion to stack, what metal to choose because, you know, there's a few to choose from. You got your gold, silver, platinum, uh, also some more obscure options. So that's an important topic to cover. How to sell your metal if the day comes when you need to sell it, how to liquidate it, how to store your metal, what to do with it once you have it. And also, I think something that's important to cover for new stackers is pitfalls to avoid, you know, bullion products that you don't want to stack, risks, things that you need to be aware of before you make your first purchase. So, in today's video, we're going to cover a lot of basic information that I just think new precious metal stackers should be aware of. So if that's what you're looking for, you are in the right place. And first of all, I do just have to get this out of the way. None of this is financial advice. You know, I'm not a financial advisor, so do your own due diligence. Take this info for what it's worth. But let's get right into it with where to acquire this stuff. Where can you get gold and silver? Where should you be buying it? Well, got a couple options here. The first one is online dealers. Now, Online dealers are great, you know, they're very convenient. You get gold and silver shipped right to your door. You can compare prices very easily across a bunch of online dealers. Me personally, I buy my gold and silver from sdbullion.com. Right now, new customers can get gold or silver at spot by visiting sdbullion.com slash new. So make sure that if you are a new stacker, that you check that out because that's a great way to get your stack started with some bullion at spot price. Now, one thing that might be a little confusing to new stackers when you go to these online dealers is how you pay. Because one thing you'll notice is just about on every product page, and this is on most online dealers, they're going to have two sets of prices. One is for if you pay with a credit card. The other one is going to be if you pay with cash. Now, the reason that they have these two prices is most bullion dealers operate on a fairly thin margin. And so if they get hit with a 2% or 2.5% credit card processing fee, which is what happens when you pay with a credit card there, they've got to pass that along to you. Or you could look at it the inverse way that if you pay with cash, whether that be via check or a wire transfer, they're going to pass those savings along to you by giving you a better price on your silver or your gold or whatever precious metal you happen to be picking up from your online dealer. Now, as far as paying cash, which is how I prefer to pay with my online dealers because that's how you get the better price, uh, there's a couple of ways you can do that. One is a wire transfer. Most people have heard of a wire transfer. That's where you go to your bank, you pay them basically. There's a fee, usually $30 to $50, somewhere in that range, and they'll wire over the money to the online dealer. Now, if you're making a very large purchase, this is probably the way to go because I think that the only way you can make a very large purchase, you know, $50,000, $100,000 is with a wire transfer. But there is that problem of having to pay a fee. And for most stackers, most people, especially who are getting started, but I mean, myself, the way I always pay is via an e-check. Uh, some dealers do allow you to mail in a paper check. I've never done that. I guess, you know, if you're not comfortable with the e-check thing, that might be a better way to go. But e-check is very easy or ACH, bank transfer. Basically what you do at checkout, you just select the e-check option and you put in your routing number and your account number for your bank account and your payment will be drafted from your bank account just like it was a check. And that allows you to get the better pricing from the online dealer. And also 
you don't have to pay a fee because you know if you're buying fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars worth of metal, a forty or fifty dollar fee for a wire transfer is not really a big deal. But if you're buying you know five hundred dollars worth of coins or rounds or bars or whatever, a fifty dollar fee that's like ten percent of your entire order. So that's a lot of money to pay in terms of fees. So I would avoid wire transfers and go for the e check option. Now the other option, as opposed to an online dealer would be to go to your local coin shop. This is a shop that specializes in gold and silver bullion. I would avoid pawn shops. You know, pawn shops may have some coins, but if you walk in and they've got, you know, guitars and weed whackers and stuff on the shelves and they happen to have some coins, probably not going to be the best deal on those coins. Just in my experience, pawn shops tend to uh, price their bullion a little higher and I'm sure that some pawn shop owners are very knowledgeable about bullion, but who knows? I mean, who knows what kind of assay or verification process they're applying to bullion that they pick up in the secondary market. What kind of guarantee do you have that it's real? Who knows? What you really want is a local coin shop that specializes in bullion. They're typically going to have much better prices on gold and silver than your pawn shops. And one thing local coin shops really have going for them in today's environment is that they have got product that they can put in your hand that day. Now, following the collapse of SVB and Signature Bank, there's been this huge influx of interest in physical metals. And right now, a lot of the major online bullion dealers are backed up with their orders. I have some gold that I ordered from SD Bullion a little over a week ago, still hasn't shipped out. Now, it's not a big deal. I'm confident that I will ultimately receive that medal. I have no doubt of it. And I also was able to lock in that price, which to me is really the important thing. But if you want to have metal in your hand the same day and not wait for long shipping times, a local coin shop is definitely a good option. So a couple tips for when you visit your local coin shop. Just like your online dealers, they're going to be able to offer you a better price if you pay with cash. So make sure you bring some physical cash with you. You don't want to whip out the credit card at the local coin shop because that's going to mean you have to pay more. Another thing is when you walk in, if you're not familiar with handling coins, if you do handle some product at the coin shop, if it's in a capsule like this, no big deal. But if you do handle some merchandise, you know, don't get your grubby fingerprints all over it. It's a, just a general good rule of thumb. If you pick up a coin at the local coin shop, hold it by the edges. Uh, you don't need to wear white gloves or anything, but, you know, don't go smudging the product up if they've got some nice BU uncirculated coins. Now, if they got some dinged up bar like this thing, probably not as big of a deal. And then one other thing is... Now, I wouldn't go in and ask for a price match or mention that, you know, SD Bullion or some other online dealer has a better price on a given product than them. That might tend to uh, tick some of these guys off. A lot of these guys, you know, they deal with people coming in and tire kicking all the time. And I'm not saying that's what you're doing if you're just, uh, you know, scouting out the market. But from their point of view, you know, that might be how they perceive things like that. So, you know, just uh, keep it brief. Feel free to ask whatever questions you need to. Uh, and then, you know, if you really want to get in good with the owner, make a purchase, you know, show them that you're serious about it. Even if you just pick up a one ounce round or, you know, a couple uh, dollars face value, of junk silver, something like that, um, it'll show them that you're a serious buyer and that will help to build a relationship with your local coin shop. Where not to buy gold and silver? Well, one place I would avoid typically is eBay. I mean, sometimes some of the big bullion dealers will have some sales on eBay, but generally they're going to have better prices on their websites. And uh, you don't want to buy from small buyers on eBay because there is the risk of counterfeits. We'll talk a little bit more about counterfeits in just a minute. Also, you know, Craigslist, flea markets, uh, any of these secondary marketplaces, unless you're really familiar with gold and silver bullion, you feel confident that you can spot uh, fakes and that sort of thing. I would just avoid those places because there's better options. Uh, garage sales and estate sales, you might find some good deals there. It's rare that you're going to find a deal on some bullion there, but it does happen. Uh, I used to go to estate sales a lot because I would uh, flip things and resell things. And occasionally I would find some coins. I mean, I always asked, uh, there were a few times I got good deals on bullion, but I would say if that's all you're looking for at garage sales and estate sales, unless you really enjoy doing it, it's probably not going to be worth your time. Now, what bullion to buy? This is an important question, obviously, probably one of the biggest questions that new stackers have. The answer is going to be subjective. Unfortunately, there's not a one size fits all answer to this. It's going to have to fit your 
overall strategy. And that's something you should have before you make your first purchase. Have some kind of a strategy. And I'll kind of give you a basic outline for one here in just a moment, but let's talk about some of the products that you can get. So uh, Silver Eagle, for example, this is sort of the default bullion coin here in the U.S. This is the official silver bullion coin of the U.S. That's made by the U.S. Mint. Right now, these have a very high premium attached to them. They're great coins. They're very recognizable. Uh, most folks are going to be familiar with those, but right now the premiums, that's the price that you pay over the actual melt value on those is extremely high. There are other sovereign coins that you might take a look at, like a Canadian maple leaf, for example. I did recently pick some of these up because SD Bullion had a nice sale on them. I don't remember exactly what the premium I got was. I think it was about $3 over spot, something like that. That was, of course, before the SVB collapse and the Signature Bank collapse, so premiums have risen a bit since those events. But if you're looking for sovereign one-ounce coins, probably want to look for something other than the Eagle at the moment. If you're watching this at some point in the far future and premiums have come down on the Eagle, they are fine coins, so nothing wrong with those. Coins just means also, for the record, something that was made by a government mint, as opposed to something like this, which is referred to as a round because this is made by a private mint. Now, these are great generic one ounce rounds. They're typically a great way to get small denomination silver. Usually you'll have a slightly lower premium for products like this than sovereign coins. So I'm a big fan of one ounce rounds. You've also got your bars. These are some 20 ounce Scottsdale bars. You've got 10 ounce stacker bars from Scottsdale Mint. And then if you want something a bit heavier, you can get something like this one kilo silver bar. And typically the advantage of buying larger products like say a 20 ounce or a 10 ounce or a one kilo bar is that the premium that you pay over spot price is going to be a bit lower than say with a one ounce product. That's because you know the Mint, they've got to pay for the cost of producing these units of bullion. And typically it's going to cost them a little bit more to make 10 of these than one of these. So that is why there is a lower premium usually on larger products. Now, as far as a strategy for stacking gold or silver, let's talk specifically about silver here. I like to have some divisible silver on hand, you know, like one ounce rounds or could be junk silver. You know, junk silver is a great thing. That's a uh, U.S. silver coins minted 1964 and earlier, half dollars, dimes, and quarters. These coins are 90% silver. The reason they call them junk is because they used to sell for right around spot. But these days, the premium on those is pretty high. I was just looking online, and it seems like they're selling for about $27 for $1 face value. So that would be like two half dollars or 10 dimes selling for 27 bucks. A dollar phase value contains about 0.715 troy ounces of silver, so that's $39 for an ounce of silver if you're buying junk. That's about a 56% premium over the spot price of $25. So that's a bit rich for me. That's why uh, right now, if I wanted to get some you know, small denomination silver, probably be going for the one ounce rounds or the coins. Uh, you don't necessarily want to get the you know, one tenth ounce rounds or half ounce rounds. Usually the premiums on those are also very high. If you want less than an ounce of silver in a product, I, junk silver is probably still the best way to go. You know, you can buy some uh, dimes or something like that. And, you know, I'm kind of a prepper stacker. That's sort of my approach. So I do like to have small denomination stuff for perhaps trade in the future in small increments. You know, if we get hyperinflation or something like that, a silver dime might be a pretty useful thing to have. But for most purposes, a one ounce round is going to be divisible enough. And you do want to have some divisible stuff like a one ounce round because let's say all you stack are kilo bars. Well, when it comes time to sell, that means the least amount of silver you can sell is going to be a kilogram of silver. You know, if you have a one ounce round or a tube of one ounce rounds, you can sell them off as needed. Also, if all you've got are big bars, you're going to limit your potential pool of buyers because there might be some folks out there who just want one or two ounces of silver. You know, they can't afford a whole kilo and so you basically price those people out if all you have is large stuff. But once you have a fair amount of divisible silver, whether that be you know junk silver or one ounce generic rounds or one ounce generic bars or coins or what have you, for me personally, my strategy is to then switch over to the lower premium products. Uh, lately, 
in the market we've been witnessing, kilo bars seem to be pretty much the best bang for your buck when it comes to silver bullion. So if you've got enough divisible silver that you feel comfortable for you know, your personal situation, your strategy, if you just want to get the most silver for your money right now, kilo bars seem to be where it is at. 100 ounce bars also fit the bill for that as well. But they're a lot bigger, and actually the premiums on them have been pretty high lately uh, relative to kilo bars. Kilo bars are actually a slightly lower premium than 100-ounce bars. That's what I've been witnessing. Uh, when it comes to gold, you can get products like, you know, this is a 10-gram bar. Uh, you can get 1-ounce gold coins, or if you want to keep things a little bit more uh, divisible, Something like this one tenth ounce gold eagle coin might be a good choice if I can get the camera to focus on it. I've got this thing in a slip, just mostly because it's so small. Uh, divisible small gold products, you know, gold is a little bit more dense than silver, so these coins are even smaller than their silver counterparts. And, you know, one tenth ounce gold coins are great. You will pay a bit of a premium for these over, say, like a one ounce or a quarter ounce gold coin, so, you know, do be mindful of that. If you want some really hyper-fractional gold, something like this goldback might be a good choice. Now, goldbacks are pretty uh, divisive, it seems like, in the stacking community. Some people like them, some people don't. I tend to be fond of them for what they are. They're a great, very, very fractional form of gold. You can see here this one goldback note actually contains one one thousandth of a troy ounce of 24 karat gold. It's gold that has been atomically layered and sandwiched between this layer of polymer material. It basically makes like a note uh, that is gold. And I think these things are very cool. Main drawback to these is the high premium associated with them. Right now, if you buy a gold back, you're going to be paying about twice the value of the gold contained in that note. But for me, doesn't really bother me too much because there's a very liquid market for these and generally you can sell these for very close to what you pay for them. So even though you are paying for a lot more than just the gold value, there is a lot of added utility with having gold in such a compact, uh, small form, you know, a thousandth of an ounce. So this is something that, you know, is designed to be used for exchange, for trade in the absence of, let's say, a paper currency. You know, if the dollar goes bye-bye if the dollar loses its world reserve currency status, if hyperinflation kicks in. This is going to be a lot easier to do transactions with than, say, this, you know, which even though it's only 10 grams, uh, I don't know exactly what the melt value of this is right now, but a troy ounce of gold is, I believe, over $2,000 today. So, you know, several hundred dollars even for a small bar like that. So if you want to trade with gold, the gold backs are something you might want to take a look at. But Speaking of the high premiums on fractional gold products like the gold back, that kind of brings us to some things you might want to avoid. And that would be very high premium bullion. You know, that could be numismatic coins. Uh, one thing that you might hear pitched to you if you call one of these uh, gold companies, you know, the kind that advertise on cable news, is they might try to sell you some pre-1933 gold like this coin. So in the U.S., just like we used to have silver coins, uh, like the junk silver, we also had gold coinage, and these were all minted before 1933. And one of the pitches you might hear for this stuff is that uh, it's not going to get confiscated or that it has some kind of collectible value because they're not minting it anymore. And yeah, I mean, that stuff may be true, but unless you're getting a really good deal on these coins, you're probably paying too much with stuff like that. If you're trying to buy things for numismatic purposes, that is like collectability, coin collectability, there's nothing wrong with it, but just recognize that, you know, that's not stacking per se. Stacking generally involves getting the most metal for your money possible. And these days, even coins like this Morgan silver dollar. So these were minted in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Very cool coins. I love Morgan dollars, but if you shop around for them right now, the premiums are pretty high. I mean, they are valued for their silver content, but there is also a lot of collectability to these because now they haven't minted these in over a century, so they're getting a little more scarce, kind of like junk silver, even more so, though. And even Peace Dollars, that's another U.S. silver dollar minted in the 20s and the 30s. These things also fetch a pretty high premium right now. So, you know, they're very cool. I like them. They're a neat piece of history. And who knows? I mean, it's possible that as collectibles, coins like that may actually go up in value faster than the price of silver. And collectibles are kind of an inflation hedge. But just be aware that if you're buying coins like that, it's not just a pure investment in silver. You're getting exposure to this kind of collectible market thing. 
and you're probably paying a lot more than the melt value of the coin. And again, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just something you need to be aware of. And personally, if you're just getting started, I would avoid this stuff unless you know you become very familiar with the collectible market. And also, you know, that can be some useful information to have if you do kind of bring yourself up to speed on what's collectible when it comes to gold and silver, because there's even uh, silver bars, you know, that are collectible. And if you educate yourself on that, you might open yourself up to getting a really good deal at some point if you're shopping around. You know, if you walk into a pawn shop or a local coin shop and they've got some uh, Morgan dollars priced at spot and you don't think they're counterfeits, well, that might be a really good deal, really good thing to pick up. And you never spot those deals if you don't educate yourself. So, you know, learn about the collectability and numismatics and things like that, but just be aware of that. And if you want to educate yourself on the value of any bullion product and what you, you know, what the going market price is for that product, a good way to do that is actually on eBay. You can go on eBay and search for whatever product you're curious about and then apply a filter which only shows sold auctions. So that's a really cool thing that eBay lets you do. You can go on there and you can look at auctions, not just what sellers are asking for the product, but you can find deals that have sold so you know what buyers are actually willing to pay for a given product in today's market. And you know, I don't buy a lot of bullion on eBay. I have bought on there in the past, but uh, it's not a, a place that I like to get a lot of my bullion, but it's a very cool tool for research. Now, if numismatics are one pitfall that you have to be aware of or you want to avoid, another to look out for is counterfeits. Now, counterfeits of most bullion products do exist. That doesn't mean that you know every single design has been copied, but if you just shop around on Wish.com or Alibaba or any of these Chinese auction sites, you'll actually not have a hard time finding manufacturers of counterfeit products in China. And these things, you know, they're not labeled uh, copies, but they're probably uh, in the case of silver products. They may be copper products with a silver coating. They may be a uh, molybdenum in terms of the larger bars that you may have some uh, bars that have a core of base metal like molybdenum or copper that have a thin layer of metal over them. Just know that they do exist. And there's a lot of ways to spot counterfeits. Um, one of the best ways is to have a known copy of the coin or a known specimen of a coin or bullion product that you know to be good, and then to compare it side by side with the coin or bar or whatever you suspect might be a counterfeit, and you can look for small differences. Uh, there's other things you can do too. You can weigh the coin or bar. You can check its density. Uh, for really large bars, you know, we're talking 100 ounce bars or 1,000 ounce bars or the 5 kilo bars, you can drill into them and take a sample of the core. In fact, if you're buying a bar like that and you're uncertain about it, that's probably a good idea because that's a big investment. There's also special devices that you can get that are specifically made for this product, electronic testers. They carry them over at SD Bullion. You can check those out. But the easiest way to avoid counterfeits, the easiest way, and you don't have to worry about it if you do this, is just to buy coins or rounds or bars that are new from the mint from reputable dealers. Then you really don't have to worry about getting counterfeits. I mean, the place you have to watch out for counterfeits is when you're buying on the secondary market, uh, when you're buying used bullion or secondary market bullion. And sometimes those are a good deal. So I'm not saying to steer away from those entirely, but just understand that if you're concerned about counterfeits, very easy way to avoid that. Just buy new stuff directly from reputable dealers and they got it from the mint. Then there's not going to be any counterfeits in there. Uh, some things, obviously, there's not a choice with, like uh, junk silver, for example, or these Morgan dollars. If I can pick this up. Uh, you know, you can't get these new from the mint. They haven't minted them since 1964. So, you know, there's always the risk that there could be some counterfeits when it comes to that sort of thing. And for that, you can get a, a verification device or... You know, if you buy from a reputable dealer, hopefully they are doing some kind of assay or verification on the products that they sell before they put them back onto the market. Most reputable dealers will do that. And you know, this is why it is so important when you're buying gold or silver just to deal with parties that you trust and that you can rely on so you don't have to worry about the possibility of the product being counterfeited. Now, in terms of what metal to buy, you really have three primary choices. You've got gold, of course, kind of the OG of stacking, the thing that has been money, at least in the most recent century, uh, more than any other metal. 
Uh, silver, really, if you look at the historical record, uh, silver is actually more commonly used as money than gold because you know gold's a little too valuable for daily transactions. But gold certainly uh, is held by central banks around the world. You know, it's very recognizable as an asset. Um, silver also, you know, like I said, silver has a very long history as money, both in the U.S. and around the world. And uh, before the 19th and 18th centuries, silver was really the uh, go-to for money. We kind of all switched over to a gold standard in the 19th century because of Great Britain. And I think it was around 1873 that all of the countries around the world switched over from bimetallic or silver-based standards to gold. But before that, silver long history as metal. So silver, you know, as far as I'm concerned, is a great thing to stack. We've also got platinum, a little more obscure than gold or silver. Talk about the choices here. You know, gold right now knocking on a all-time high. Uh, it's over $2,000 at the time I'm recording this video. The all-time high for gold around $2,075, I think is the highest daily close. So we're getting very close to that. The inflation adjusted all time high for gold is around $2,600, somewhere around there. So, you know, still some room for gold to go up from here. And I think with everything that's going on in the world, we are going to see much higher gold prices. But when you compare that to silver, silver is around 25 bucks right now. The all time high for silver is around 50. So, right now, Silver is only around half of its all-time high, and that's from back in 1980. Now, if you adjust that $50 all-time high from 1980 for inflation, it gives you a number over $190. So right now, the price of silver at 25 bucks is around 13% of its inflation-adjusted all-time high. So if you ask me, silver is extremely cheap right now, even more so than gold, and that's kind of why I focus on stacking silver for the most part because I like to buy the thing that's cheaper you know it's on sale it's very cheap it has a lot more room to run up and that's something that typically happens when you have a big precious metals bull market is silver tends to outperform gold there's a thing you can look at called the gold to silver ratio it's just the price of gold divided by the price of silver basically tells you how many ounces of silver an ounce of gold costs and right now the number it's not as high as it you know, has been ever. Uh, the all-time high was somewhere around uh, 113, I think. It was over 110 back in 2020 when the price of both metals collapsed, because that's the other thing that happens. When the price of metals fall, the price of silver tends to fall faster. So it moves faster, the silver market, on the downs and the ups. Uh, but right now, silver, very cheap relative to gold. Platinum is also uh, very undervalued, I think, at the moment. Back in the year 2008, platinum was about twice the price of gold, and now those roles have reversed. Right now, platinum around a thousand bucks. I'm not sure the exact spot price right now, but it's about half the price of gold. So if you're looking at that ratio, platinum, the better buy at the moment. And there's some other platinum group metals you might hear about. Uh, palladium, that's one we saw a spike up in the price of palladium following Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year because Russia controls a lot of the world's palladium production. And an interesting chart to look at is the production of platinum of the BRICS nations between Russia and South Africa. They have a big chunk of the world's platinum. So uh, that might be a reason to consider getting some of that into your stack. There's a rhodium. That's another platinum group metal that saw a big spike up over the past couple of years. I think it went from under $1,000 to up close to 30000 in just a matter of a few years. Now it's come back down quite a bit from uh, those highs, but still it kind of goes to show you what a metal like platinum, which, you know, there's a very small supply of platinum can do compared to a metal like gold or silver. To give you an idea of the available supply of platinum, um, if you take a look at all the gold ever mined in human history, I think it'll fill up something like three Olympic swimming pools, whereas the total platinum supply it will come up to your ankles in one Olympic swimming pool. So platinum is a lot more scarce than gold. And, you know, when it comes to supply and demand, uh, having a limited supply is definitely a good thing. I mean, that's what we're witnessing with junk silver right now. You know, the premiums on that are spiking up because the supply just can't expand. They haven't made it in a long time. A lot of those coins have been melted. And so, you know, when you have a very constrained supply of something, uh, the possibility for a big move up in the price certainly exists. Now, the downside of platinum doesn't really have the monetary history that gold and silver have. Uh, yes, there have been some coins made of platinum. I think Russia in the 19th century had some platinum coins, but platinum really wasn't being refined uh, out of ores until the 18th or 19th century. And so it just doesn't have the history going back 
thousands of years the way gold and silver do, but I still think there's a place for it in your stack. I mean, as you can see, I have some here. Uh, it is a little more speculative, but you, know, you can diversify your precious metals holding by adding some platinum. And uh, it is undervalued at the moment, I think, relative to gold. So that's a good way to, uh, you know, get exposure to a little more potential upside. Now, when it comes to selling your precious metals, how do you sell these things? Because that's obviously important. I mean, stacking them up is great. Uh, me personally, I mean, I think it's likely I may never sell for fiat dollars. I may just uh, hold them until the next monetary paradigm, which I think may be coming in my lifetime. But you know, I might sell some silver or some gold at some point if I want to, uh, you know, pay off uh, some some debt or something like that. I mean, if you have a mortgage on your house, then, you know, selling your gold and silver, if they uh, inflate up, they go into a bubble just to pay that stuff off might be a good idea. There's a lot of reasons you might want to sell your gold and silver. I mean, gold and silver kind of are like a savings account for me. So if you have an unexpected expense, it's something you can tap into. They're very easy to sell. They're extremely liquid assets. One way that you can sell them is you can sell to online dealers. You can go to sdbullion.com slash sell, and they will give you a list of what they're paying for gold and silver right now, various products. Um, a lot of the products right now they're paying over spot for because that's how the premiums are working at this time when you know all of the this influx of interest in the precious metals markets has driven premiums way up following the bank troubles that we've witnessed. So, you know, if you sell your physical metal, you're even going to get over spot for a lot of products right now. You can also go to your local coin shop and sell. That's probably an easy way to do it. You know, you'll get cash in your hand that day or a check. Uh, as far as local coin shops go, you know, I would recommend calling around, seeing what they're paying. Uh, gold and silver, uh, platinum for that matter, all these things are pretty much commoditized products. So whether you're buying or selling, you know, it's going to be the same coin that you get when you're buying. It's going to be the same cash that you get when you're selling. So really you just want to shop around and make sure you're getting the best deal possible when you go to sell. If you want to get a bit more for your money rather than selling to a market maker like an online dealer or your local coin shop, you could try to sell to an end user, a collector, a retail buyer themselves. A couple of ways you can do that. You know, you can do it on eBay, although you will have to pay some fees there. So that might detract from the, you know, extra price, the better price you're going to get by selling it that way. You can sell to someone in person. I'll leave it to you how to find a buyer. That could be someone in your personal contacts. I will say, you know, use caution if you're meeting a stranger to sell them some gold or silver. Probably want to meet somewhere like in a bank lobby or somewhere safe like that. You can see the people withdraw the cash. That way you know it's good and it's not a uh, fake paper money. You know, I wouldn't take a uh, cashier's check or anything like that for gold or silver because who knows, they can uh, be faked as well. So, you know, there's a ton of caveats if you're doing something like that. Just exercise caution if you're dealing with somebody other than a trusted bullion dealer or local coin shop, if it's an individual you know well, that's fine. But if you're dealing with strangers, just exercise caution. If you want an easy way to sell, just go with the local coin shop. Although, you know, you will probably get a better price if you sell to an individual because you're cutting out the middleman that way. All right. Now, as far as storing your precious metals, where do you keep this stuff once you get it? You want to keep it safe, right? Well, there's a lot of ways you can do that. Uh, the first most obvious thing, you know, get a safe, probably a good investment if you're going to be stacking. You want to get something that is relatively fire and burglar resistant. A really good safe can be kind of expensive, but that's a good investment. Uh, other things you can do, you know, you can hide your gold or your silver. Now, silver is kind of bulky, might be kind of hard to conceal a large stack of silver, but gold, you can store a lot of wealth in a very compact area with gold. So, you know, hiding gold is uh, not that difficult of an undertaking. Uh, you can case your metal, you, know, you can put it in a tube and bury it somewhere. Just make sure you take good notes and you don't lose it. Also, you know, you might want to leave a little indicators of where that might be in case, you know, God forbid something happened to you. You don't want your family uh, not knowing about that buried cache. Uh, there's also private vaulting companies like Brinks and others. I mean, there's a lot of these companies who you pay a small fee to, a small percentage, and they will store your metal securely for you. And a lot of these companies like Brinks, they've been operating for 100 years plus, very good track records of keeping assets safe. So that's an option. Uh, I will say, you know, you probably want to be wary of bank safe deposit boxes, especially in this day and age of bank failures. I have used them in the past, but I probably will not continue to do so in the future. I think you're much better off with a private 
vaulting service if you want to go that route because who knows, one day you might show up to your bank and the doors might be closed and you don't have access to those assets. Uh, now, whether you take custody of the metal yourself or you use a service or you bury it or you hide it, whatever you do with it, I will say you probably don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. It's probably best to take a diversified approach to storage. That's probably the best way to go. Now, just do your research. You know, If you're going to go with a vaulting service, make sure you vet them. Make sure they have a good reputation. And also, you know, everybody's situation is different. If you live in a compound out in the woods, your storage situation is going to be significantly different from somebody in the suburbs. And that person's situation is going to be a lot different from somebody in a apartment in the city or someone in a dorm room. I mean, there's a lot of different considerations when it comes to storing metal. So make sure you find a storage solution that fits your needs. Be discreet and diversify where you keep your metals. Again, none of this is advice. You know, I'm not responsible for where you keep your precious metals. I'm just sharing with you some ideas and some food for thought. And one thing to think about is if you have a fair size stack, you might want to consider keeping some of it with one of those vaulting services, possibly internationally. You know, if you have a service with a good reputation and they're outside of the country that you live in, that might not be a bad idea because that way, if you ever have to leave the country that you happen to be in, you might have some hard assets waiting for you at your destination. And, you know, it might be a lot better than just loading yourself up with gold jewelry. Of course, you know, that's one way you can take uh, gold in a relatively discreet way across borders as well. But planning ahead and having some internationally allocated or unallocated metal storage might be something to consider. So all of those are some basic tips for new stackers. You know, I know that there's a lot of people getting into stacking these days. So I just wanted to provide some basic information, an updated view on what new gold and silver stackers need to look at. I think that as the economic and geopolitical situation continues to deteriorate before our eyes, the trend of individuals getting into hard assets is going to continue. If you want some additional information for new stackers, something beyond the basics that I just laid out in this video, then check out this video here. This has some additional tips that I think will benefit you as a new stacker. And I know that I've been getting a lot of comments on the channel lately, folks saying, oh, I wish I'd started stacking sooner. I feel like I've missed some opportunities. Look, silver is still 25 bucks an ounce. So, you know, if you're stacking now, you are still early to the party. And I think now is a great time to get started acquiring hard assets. I don't know how long that window is gonna stay open where we can get silver for 25 bucks but it's available now. So uh, good luck to all of you new stackers. What do you think? Was this video helpful at all? Was this good info for you? Leave me a comment down below to let me know. Thanks for watching everyone. Stay safe and happy stacking. Smart Silver Stacker out.